just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 340 of Science on Top. Today is Monday the 16th of September 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi. And this show is only possible thanks to the generous support from our Patreon subscribers. People like Ryan James and Dan Kruger who have been chipping in each episode to help us pay the bills and keep the lights on. If you want to join such esteemed company, just head to scienceontop.com slash donate. But let's begin, and Penny, why would nobody ever tell a T-Rex to keep a cool head? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I really enjoyed this story because um, I always like, well, I'm really into my, ch- my children are very into the dinosaur stage. At the I moment. like the way you covered that. I'm really into yeah, yeah. Oh, my children. Really into, I mean, really my children. Dinosaurs. By proxy, I'm really into them now. <laughs> I'm into dinosaurs. It's okay. Yeah. There's no shame in it. And this is something else that I was always interested in when I was teaching um, VCE biology. That's biology for senior secondary students, which is thermoregulation. So it's nice to find out something new about dinosaurs, especially the um, you know charismatic megafauna par excellence, which is Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, so T-Rex has two holes in its skull and it's usually been thought that they were filled by muscles. So, you know, there's a lot, if you have a look at an animal's skull, even a human skull, you'll see there's all these kind of holes or loops, which are for muscles to go up. So if something that you can do quite easily is touch your cheekbone and then your jaw muscle is actually, you know, your jaw muscles actually go up behind that and attach to your head and so on. But there's now a new theory about what this hole in the T-Rex skull might have been, and it's based on alligators. And the idea is that it's actually not a super logical place for a muscle attachment to go in terms of biomechanics. However, if you look at alligators, which are very, very ancient reptiles, um, they actually have a whole lot of blood vessels in that area. And what that can do is be a really important feature for temperature regulation. And it's been suggested that um, Tyrannosaurus rex might have a similar thing. Now, these blood vessels have been shown to um, be important in alligators for thermal regulation through thermal imaging. So this is, you know, not always easy to do because it's hard to get close enough to an alligator. So this was done at a farm um, rather than in the wild. And thermal imaging of the alligators. So big animals need to cool down somehow. When it was cooler and when they're trying to warm up, then there's big hot spots in these holes showing that it's riser. But when it's warmer and they're trying to um, cool down, then these show these holes these blood vessel filled holes seemed to show like they were turned off to get cool and the idea about this is the blood vessels is that you know your blood is always running through your body through your core or i'm saying you but you know for animals so if it's close to the surface of the body it will cool down it's why you one of the reasons why you flush and go red when you're overheating because the blood's going to the surface of the skin where the environment is cooler and it can cool down. Conversely, to really protect itself when it's cold, you know, and this is for, I'm talking about humans because that's what we know best, you know, circulation can cut off to extremities like fingers and toes um, because to keep the core warm, there's no point putting your blood out into your fingers and coals to cool down. So blood is really important for regulating temperature. And I just think it's really interesting to think of that in terms of a T-Rex's function. Um, it's a new idea about what it was doing. Um, it apparently really clears up some weird anatomy issues that would have been had with like showing that those holes were for muscle attachments. And it's just 
it's just I, I really like a new way of looking at dinosaur skeletons but thinking about the physiology, so how these animals actually functioned as well as just looking at their anatomy. So, yeah, so that's why I enjoyed reading that story. It is interesting because when you think about it, like, I mean, obviously we don't know because we weren't there, but how much facial expressions would a Mm. T-Rex need to make necessarily? How many muscles would it need in its face? Whereas these are, because they're towards the front of the, uh, the head, aren't they? They're sort of on its snout, I guess, aren't they? Yeah, it had quite a big head. <laughs> yeah. Um, so presumably it's not snarling so much uh, and they're there to cool it down. That's, that's an interesting way to look at it. When you yeah. look at an alligator, of course, they don't have those you know, facial expressions. They don't snarl quite so much. They're fairly fixed, I guess you'd say. Mm. I don't think they need to snarl. They look snarly. They look so scary. Just naturally. <laughs> this is true. Although the photo in the uh, BBC article is actually quite cute because when you look at it after a while, you realise it's a little baby alligator on the mama alligator's head, which is kind of cute and also scary. And as you say, I like the idea of, well, we've always assumed it was this, but do we ever actually look at why we thought that? Let's maybe investigate that further and come up with some other ideas yeah all right lucas let's talk about another case of computers are coming for our jobs where a team at flinders university in south australia has developed a flu vaccine they believe is the first human drug to be completely designed by artificial intelligence this is kind of cool very cool although as you say maybe a a, an unfortunate indication of yet another job that might not be safe from being automated. Um, so, yes, as you quite rightly said, it was a team in at Flinders University in South Australia. They developed a new vaccine, which is believed to be the first human drug in the world to be completely designed by artificial intelligence. That caught my eye because I thought, okay, well, you know, how good could it be? Apparently very good. Apparently really, really good. So this, um, the AI uh, is called uh, Search Algorithm for Ligands, so, or SAM for short. Um, so it's named for what it does. It's an, it's, uh, it searches using an algorithm for ligands, which are basically um, compounds that are, that are used for human drugs. So... Basically, it's as simple as you can possibly think in terms of its overall um, you know, approach. They feed, they feed this program, this AI, they feed it a set of uh, compounds that are known to activate the human immune system. So they go, these, these are good, these work. Then they feed it with a set of compounds that don't work. These ones, they're not going not gonna to work. And then what the AI has to do is try and figure out for itself what works and what doesn't and why. And then it can start using effectively pattern matching to find other compounds that will work. So the second part of the scenario was they made another program, which uh, its job was basically just to create a whole lot of a whole lot of um, uh, compounds. So it generated trillions of different chemical compounds, which they then fed into Sam. And then Sam just went about its job, just sifting through these things and trying to find candidates that, you know, that might be good to uh, to treat humans for things, for stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really simple. Complex algorithms, no doubt, but it went about its work. And, and the thing about these, the thing about AI is it, it doesn't rest. It doesn't stop. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. just keeps going. It's like Terminator. It doesn't <laughs> need sleep. Um, so it just it just trawled through and it basically spat out a whole lot of potential candidates, a whole lot of candidates for, for, for treatments. So what they found was that of these candidates, they took the, the top candidates, it's not clear how they identified which ones were the top, but they then tested them on human blood cells. And in so doing, they confirmed not only that Sam could find good drugs, but it appeared to have come up with better immune drugs than currently exist. Um, so what they did is they took the uh, compounds that were created uh, or identified by Sam, they synthesized them in a lab, 
They tested them on human uh, blood and they went, oh dear, that's very interesting. <laughs> so then they took these drugs and they did some animal tests with them. And things are looking very, very promising that particularly for seasonal influenza, these new uh, vaccines based on the, on the compounds that they've found may be significantly better than everything that's out there right now. Now, there's very good news. Obviously, this could shorten the, the time frame and the amount of money it takes to discover uh, and develop drugs. So that this usually takes decades. So that's a really good thing. It'll save millions, hundreds of millions of dollars probably in that search. Now, consider how groundbreaking this is, right? We have uh, influenza is, is, a, is a worldwide problem. Um, just in Australia Huge. alone, we had um, 57 people just in New South Wales and 48 in, in Victoria people died before June 2019 this year from influenza. That's just in Australia, not looking at the other states. Uh, you consider this on the worldwide scale. There's been uh, apparently huge. I've lost US. the figures. Huge, yeah, ridiculous numbers. Um, but uh, so, so the numbers are, are fairly significant, and there's quite a, an impact on our health system. And it, of course, really affects the elderly and the in, um, those who have got uh, an immune deficiency or the immunocompromised. Now, this sounds pretty cool. So the team took the work to the um, the Australian uh, what's it called again Australian Australian National oh, Health and Medical USB Research now. Council. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> so the NHMRC. The NHMRC and said, "Okay, we need some funding now to develop this further. So we've got we've got some compounds. We now need to do some some um, animal testing. We'd like to move forward with with human trials." And they said, "No." They said, "No, sorry, can't help you with that." Um, it's not something we're really into. So the NHMRC basically said, um, and they, they, they did release a statement that was put into the end of this story, uh, which was funding applications for health and medical research projects are subject to rigorous expert peer review against published criteria to ensure transparency, probity, and fairness. Therefore, only applications, including applications for the development of flu vaccines of the highest quality are funded by the NHMRC. This really is highlighting one particular problem and one that uh, the lead researcher has pointed out that it's really hard to get funding to carry your research forward in Australia. Hmm. We tend in this country to fund only things that have very clear outcomes right from the outset. So we can look at it and go, okay, this thing, if we develop it, will lead to this thing and therefore there's a dollar value that we can attach to it and therefore we will move forward with it. Now, in the early stages, his, his AI was unproven. They didn't know what the, what it would be able to do, and they were looking for funding for it. And NHMRC said, no. Nope. So then he went over to the US. He approached the NIH, or a part of the NIH, which is um, a National Institute of uh, Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the United States, and then he, he secured funding from them and has actually since secured funding a, a number of uh, subsequent times from them to continue on with the research. And they've now actually begun 12-month clinical trials across the US with right. these okay. vaccines. So the application to the NHMRC and all that, that wasn't recent. That was sometime before they'd come up with these compounds. Is that right? Correct. Right. Yes, exactly. uh, now I understand. I thought that was you know, just recently after they've come up with these exciting compounds and they wanted more money and they weren't getting it. That Okay, right. Yes, so, yeah, and, and see, there, there, there is exactly the problem that uh, um, in Australia it is very, very difficult to, to get funding unless there's very clear hmm. outcomes known right away. Okay, well, we fund this because we're going to get this outcome. But that was not clear at the beginning of this, and, and, and this is really – a big problem in Australia where we've had so many governments talking about, um, you know, the clever country and investing in education, investing in research. But in reality, you and I and Penny and everyone that, you know, all of our friends who work in science field and people who've been on the show, one thing that comes loud and clear over and over again is in this country, it is really hard to have a research career in science because, the money gets given to the larger organisations 
Um, and so many people we know have had to go overseas in order to secure mm-hmm. funding to just continue their career. And he said the same thing. I think it's not so much just Australian thing. I think it's it's worldwide. It's particularly hard with governments to get blue sky research funding. Uh, oh, absolutely. Because they, they're answerable can... to taxpayers who want to know yes. why are we spending money, why are we doing research on fruit flies, why are we doing this, you know? Right. And the thing is there have been times in the past that we have spent money on these things and we have sure. valued research for research's sake. But uh, in the last, you know, number of governments that, that you know that's really shifted unfortunately and uh as a result as i said you and i we know quite a lot of people who mm-hmm. have moved away from this country to do their science elsewhere or worse which is really sad. they've moved away from science altogether and they've gone into right, teaching or true. some other field yeah. although big win for the for teaching big win for sure. the for their yeah. students but but certainly a you know potential loss for all the things that they could have uh, potentially found through their research so I think it's just a reminder of how important research is and, and how, you know, st- uh, making choices about what we fund simply based on a measurable defined outcome right at the beginning is really no way to do science if you want to forge ahead and do new things because so much comes out of uh, we don't know where this is going to go. We've got a basic idea, but we can't, you know, we can't, mm. we can't guarantee that that will be the outcome. It is Difficult, though. I can also see if I was on the uh, council at the NHMRC, I can see why they might be reluctant to fund a lot of the grants that they get, which must seem like crackpot ideas a lot of the time. And how do you necessarily decide what blue sky research warrants a grant and what doesn't? Um, It's always going to be a... a, It's always going to start with how much you... You've got to give. Exactly. Um, You've and, only got a finite resource that you can divvy up amongst it, and someone is always going to lose out. Absolutely. And that would have always been the case. Uh, the difference is now that the, the money that goes into that, the money that's made available for funding projects like this is is, is shrinking. It's shrinking year on year. Um, so we're, we're kind of guaranteeing that we've got a, 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 a loss of talent overseas or out of the fields and and that's a real shame we're we're comparatively we're a very wealthy country um on a per capita basis our gdp is very very high we should be able to make a priority out of research and then you know we've had we have organizations like the csiro that over the years i mean shane used to work that with csiro Mm -hmm. but over the years we've uh um we've seen the csiro's um mission uh, change and shrink mm-hmm. uh, and things that they're that they used to work on in, in various fields particularly around agriculture and so forth um, have, have pretty much shifted overseas or just been abandoned in Australia and it's really sad because we can't afford it if we if we want to make it a priority we can't afford to fund more um, so that was just something that really struck me from this story is that um, this team did manage to receive grants overseas and successive grants over and over again. And so now he's had grants totaling over more than 50 million US dollars uh, by US standards, which, as, as, as he pointed out, is, is actually quite extraordinary. Um, but it just shows that uh, there's obviously some uh, criteria under which the, the, uh, at least the US government felt that this was worthwhile. Sure. Well, I guess also... The US government, like the CDC, are probably saving all that money by not studying gun deaths, for example, which they're no longer allowed to do, <laughs> or climate change. So they've got the yeah. money free to spend, which is right. making uh, something yeah. a bit flippant. We don't study about gun deaths either. We don't need to. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, just a little bit of politics to spice up the, <laughs> the podcast there. <laughs> <laughs> But let's move on then. And speaking of very small brains, uh, <laughs> let's talk about the uh, team at Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which has painst- well, is currently painstakingly mm. building a very detailed map of a mouse brain. And Penny, this sounds laborious to say the least. It sounds hideous. It sounds like the kind of research that... You could not pay, you could say, Penny, you can have a job next door to your house and I'll pay you a million dollars a year. And I'd be like, "Mm, no, thanks. Um, It just sounds very laborious. So I've always been fascinated by this idea of mapping nervous systems and mapping 
brains. I think I know that the nervous system of a, I think a couple of organisms now has been mapped. I know one of the nematode worms has, but this is a map of the brain. And it's not just a map of, you know, that you might do at school where you say, oh, this is the hippocampus, this is the corpus callosum, but it's a map of the individual neurons and where they go. So the methodology is to give the mice um, a virus that essentially makes a few neurons glow and then image the brain and trace where those neurons are with a microscope. And this is a 3D image. And so then um, you can then, or they can put together these images to create a three-dimensional map of where the neurons go. This process to take a single neuron takes about a day. It used to take um, a couple of weeks, so they've got it down. So um, there's been a 1,000 neurons tracked so far, um, traced so far, and that's on from 300 neurons in 2017. So how many neurons... Does a mouse brain have? Oh, is a like thousand s- nearly done? Or no, a thousand is not nearly enough. It contains about seventy million neurons. So there's no way that this will ever be a complete map. But they suggest that maybe if they could map maybe like a hundred thousand, it's going to give a bit of a fuzzy view. So they compared it to you know a tourist map with big landmarks on it, rather than okay. your really detailed cartograph. You know. So what can this tell us about mice brains? Um, It can give us a clue about how the brain is wired. So, you know, are are neurons clustered into different categories? Is there a lot of communication from one area of the brain to another? Or is it kind of confusing? Does it seem to be going everywhere? So are the pathways not clear, you know, little goat tracks rather than highways? So I just think it's a really ambitious project. I think it's is. Been, yeah. If so it's one day per neuron, and, and they've got they're, seventy they're million at, neurons, or even just a hundred thousand. Even just a hundred thousand. However, I'm guessing that if it's got down from two weeks to a day, hmm. there'd be a hope it would get down from a day to sure less. Well, it, it took us ten years to map the human genome, and now you can do it in a day, sort of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. It's, it'll be interesting to see what kind of research this is used. I mean, mouse models are very commonly used and popular. Um, I don't know how applicable it is to human studies or to other species that we're interested in the brain function, but, um, it's just, it's interesting to know more about mammals and mammal nervous systems and how they work in this kind of detailed level. Absolutely. That'd be very interesting. One to keep an eye on. But I think that's our show. Quick one today, but uh, interesting stuff, definitely. Still managed to get a soapbox in there. That's always good. (laughs) (laughs) We always manage to rant at some point. (laughs) And as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 340. Big thank you to all our Patreon supporters. Uh, go to scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to sign up and throw a few dollars our way for each episode. Very much appreciated. And of course, thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you to everyone for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Environmental royalty has crossed paths with real royalty at the official naming ceremony for a new polar research ship in the UK. Andrew Lund explains. It's rare that William and Kate are not the most popular people at a public event, but today they came a very close second to Sir David Attenborough at an event just across the Mersey at the docks for the official naming of Britain's new polar research vessel. Now, you might remember this ship sprung to global fame a few years ago when they held a public naming competition for it. The popular vote was for Boaty McBoatface. That sparked something of a global phenomena. They opted not to go with that name, although it has been given to a scientific submarine. Instead, the new vessel has been named after Sir David Attenborough. It was Kate who did the honours as tradition dictates, and William admitted to a degree of relief as he was introducing the world-renowned wildlife scientist 
rather than Bodie McBoatface. It is my immense privilege and relief to welcome Sir David Attenborough, rather than Boaty McBoatface, to speak. Scientists say the work that this boat will be undertaking has never been more important given the changes that are occurring to the climate, particularly in the polar regions. Uh, once commissioning work is completed around this time next year, the Sir David Attenborough will be making annual trips to Antarctica.